Bonjour. Buenos dias. How many Spanish people do we have in the room? Why am I? Oh, you're not Spanish, you're Australian. Doesn't count. Uh, good morning, everybody. So my name is Isabel Money. I work for a company called WSO2. Who has heard about WSO2? A few, well, okay, two, three, four, a few people, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Olga. <laughs> um, so hopefully by the end of this talk, you will know a bit about what we do. And, um, you know, there's some context. So I'll actually talk about the company in the last chart. Uh, first, what I want to do is talk to you about ecosystems. So actually, Julie has done an amazing job before on explaining that, you know, doing APIs uh, from a technical point of view is very important. But the ecosystem that you build around your APIs is very critical as well. So I'm going to push on that concept and explain that using a customer story. It's a very good customer story of, our, of ours. You all know this customer. You will see when I name them. Um, so let me talk a little bit about connected business first and what that means. Um, so basically, something like 20 years ago, so I spent most of my career, so I know a lot of people in this room, from my IBM days. I spent about 17 years at IBM. Uh, when I joined IBM uh, in 90-something, um, IBM was this big company. It's still a big company, but I mean, what we were doing is like everything was on site. If you needed to travel somewhere, you will go to the IBM travel agency. But you wouldn't imagine, so whoever is like less than 45 in this room, which is most of the people, now, you know, if you want to travel somewhere, you would never think of stepping into a travel agency, especially not in your company. Does anybody have a travel agency in their companies today? No. When you go, you go on the internet, you click three clicks, you go, you know, low cost, beam, boom, five minutes later, you have a printed thing, you can travel, okay? The reason this has evolved, and it's really the fuel of the API economy, as we know it, is that the cost, basically, at that time, 20 years ago, to be able to integrate all the system was very expensive, so it was not worthy doing. Or it was much better if you had everything on site. Since then, of course, things have been changing a lot, right? But what that means is you need to connect all those things. So now IBM probably connects to Hertz and other agencies and different things so that the IBMers can travel. I don't know anymore, I'm not there. But the idea is that you have all those different companies that need to talk to each other, and the fuel of all that is APIs. And let's see how that works, okay? So connecting a business, what does it mean? As Julie very well explained, it's about connecting yourself with your customers, with your partners, with your internal people as well, that's also very important, your internal systems, your external systems. And that's really what we call becoming a connected business because really the idea is about connecting everything to everything, right? Just to give you some pictures. Um, our CTO, his name is Paul Fremantle, um, has created this notion, he says, you know, virtualization is known as a word for virtualizing servers. We all know what it means. You know, only like five years ago, probably, if you wanted to deploy an application on a server, what you had to do is you go and see your favorite operations person and you put a request in and they'll, you know, install a machine for you and eventually a week later, maybe more, um, maybe months later, you'll have a system where you can deploy your app. Now you can't, you know, ops, they can't do that to you anymore. <laughs> that doesn't work, right? Because you can just go to Amazon and do a three clicks and there you go. You have your server, you deploy it there and off it goes, right? That's the new way of doing things. Uh, same thing for applications. Now it's all about PaaS and application as a service. That's kind of another form of virtualization. Same thing for APIs. You don't do import my library anymore. What you do is you call an API. That's another form of virtualization of that information. And finally, stores. So I'll pick up on that a bit later in the presentation. Uh, we have went from a place where you have a central registry with all the information contained to really stores, right? The notion of a store has changed our lives. Now, anybody now can go to a store, install an app. You know, even my mom can do that. <laughs> right? Absolutely, everybody, there's a lot of predictions from Gartner that say that in the next five years, people won't browse anymore. 
and there will be no there will be no browsing to your bank site anymore. It will be install the bank app, and that's how you will interact with your bank, right? So that's another evolution of all this um, of the context that gives you control, that gives you agility. There's a lot of things now that really allow you to do things today that were incapable to do like five years ago. Okay, all of this has unleashed creativity. Uh, so creativity is important, not like in that picture. Uh, go in there and think out of the box, all right? But for creativity to work, you need some constraints. Right? If you don't constrain that little guy into this thing, he's gonna bump all over and hurt himself, right? So you need a sandbox and something to control uh, how you actually move in the system. So steps to an ecosystem. Let me talk to you about this customer and illustrate how they have uh, evolved. So this is Boeing. Basically, we've been working with Boeing for the past year on a project called a, they call a digital airline. I can't really detail, um, so I say this for the Q&A session after as well, I can't really detail how they've done it and the details of the installation and how it's working. I can give this at a high level, but not so much into details at their requests. But the story and where they came from is really important to show you the power of APIs and how they went from a very centralized system into something now which is extremely distributed and open to all their customers. So this is the reasoning, right? When you buy a plane from Boeing, which any of you can do if you have $300 million, <laughs> right? That's an easy thing to do. Um, basically, this is when really you start a really strong partnership with Boeing, or if you buy it from Airbus, it will be exactly the same. The idea is you have to you know, track that plane, the maintenance of that plane, the parts that may be breaking, um, the regular maintenance that need to happen of it. So it is a very strong relationship and constant communication between Boeing and all the ecosystem which is around them, all right? So right now they have a huge amount of data. Big data for them, they've been doing for like five or six years. They've been, they've, um, uh, to give you an example that uh, the customer gave us, every time a plane from Boeing does one flight, depending on the plane, there's between one meg and 25 megs of data which is being generated for every plane, every flight, okay? So what they do is they store all of that because they need the entire history of the plane flights if something happens. So even that flight was built in, sorry, that plane was built in 2002 and something happens today, they need the entire historical information of that plane since 2002. So there's a huge amount of data that they have to deal with, right? So what they did is to say, okay, we're gonna break up and, and do a complete different way of working at Boeing we're going to decentralize the way we're working. We're going to expose all this information, all this data in a very secure way, of course, right? So, I mean, airline one cannot be accessing the data of the planes of airline two. To give you an example, that's a rough one, or by a role. So if I'm a mechanics from a third party company, I can't see the same information about the plane if I am a mechanics from actually the actual company, say Delta Airlines, right? So they've exposed all these data as APIs, break it up, and then they said, okay, now what's next? And this is where the ecosystem comes into the picture. Because if you just expose your APIs and say, well, somebody will come and consume them eventually at some point, that is really not enough, okay? You really have to build that ecosystem. So what they've built is the ecosystem, right? What does that mean? What they want to enable is their partners, like the customers, which are the airlines, which are all the companies around the planes, to come and be able to consume those APIs in a very efficient way. So not only did they give them the APIs, they also gave them the entire platform to actually create the applications that call those APIs, all right? What do you think they use to actually do that? What type of technology? What do we have today to allow people to come and easily create an app, deploy it, et cetera, et cetera? How we call that? No, 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 not to the create the apps and deploy them. We need a patch, right? Platform as a service, cloud. So they've mixed basically 
cloud, APIs, and of course, mobiles. What you see on that picture, there's this guy with his iPad. So the first application that came out on this platform was an application to allow the mechanics that every time you land on an airport with a plane, there's this flow of people coming around it that have to check that the plane is all right so they can actually go and, and take off again, okay? So what those guys can do um, is that they can come and see all the historical data about the plane, as I said, check everything is okay, and right there from this iPad, just click and say, it's all fine, um, you know, certifying the plane is all good. Or something is wrong, okay? So the guy on the left here, what he's doing is he's taking a picture of a part of the landing gear which, is, which has a problem. That will go straight into a system that orders automatically um, the, um, this piece to check it and replace it on the next flight automatically. Okay, all of this is going through APIs connecting every single person who has access to that information and has a, and plays a different role in managing that information. Okay, so they've mixed data, mobile, cloud to actually generate that solution. So what did they do? Well, the first thing they did is that they had a huge amount of data, gigs and gigs and, well, not gigs, terabytes of data on the different planes for the different airlines. So they picked one use case, which you know is very much the way you should do when you start this kind of projects, to take a thin slice in the agile way and say, we're gonna expose that information as API, manage them, secure them, let's say, you know, Boeing or Airbus or this kind of customers, there's no room, zero room for failure. Where we, you know, you don't want your plane to fail, right? <laughs> when you're flying over here. Now, they have the most constrained rules and processes I've ever seen, which is normal, all right? So the way they manage this, the entire system, the way they access the data and everything they do needs to be extremely reliable. They have pushed us to our limits in terms of our products to be able to fit and match their requirements, okay, in terms of security. So they went, take all this data, expose all this API, of course monitor them, which is a very important aspect of your APIs. Don't forget about monitoring, right? Once you have deployed them, monitoring them, knowing what's happening, who is using them, et cetera, is a critical part of that. If you don't have these reports to put on the boss you know, desk on Monday morning, you're gonna be in trouble because people are not going to see their you know, the return on investment of the platform and APIs that you've been creating. So that's an extremely important part, all right? So they've created all of this, exposed it as services. I have all those logos in there because really, we don't care if the services are in .NET, they're written in PHP or whatever it is. Just place the API management layer in front of it that gives you all the monitoring, okay? And of course, the security. So that's the first thing they did. Everything is, of course, mobile ready, as you saw. Um, th this guy in here was using this iPad. This is extremely critical to them. They also give an iPad to every pilot now in most airlines. So they have the actual uh, book that was like this big before uh, with all the documentation about every plane that they have to have with them when they fly. Now they don't have this anymore. They all have an iPad and all this documentation is on the iPad as well. So this is like automatically updated and everything through the same uh, set of APIs. So that's the first thing they did. And the second thing is they said, hmm, all right, now we have those APIs, we're happy with them, we've created those mobile applications. Now really what we want is we want the airlines, now they picked up one airline, uh, worked with them to say, we want you to come and consume those APIs and create your own applications on your data, which is saved as Boeing, that you can give to your, to your mechanics, to, your, to everybody else, okay? And not only that, what we want is you to share with the other airlines, so that's where the eco master ecosystem comes into the picture. So you're gonna do some stuff, and probably, you know, say it's Delta Airlines, the next day there's Air France coming in, and they're probably going to need the same support and the same stuff you've done for their airline. You're happy to actually contribute to the system 
So we will give you the base APIs, but you guys can do maybe like both composite APIs. Maybe you can create some apps that will actually be shared with the others. So this is where, you know, they needed something to allow people to share uh, in a central place, but also share within the company only. So they've built all that exosystem. And the, the first thing, you know, the airline said is like, this really got, I mean, you know, we love your idea. We really want to do this. But we don't want to build the entire system to be able to develop those applications. Now, give us something easy. So all we have to do is go on the portal somewhere. And all I have to do is say, create new application. I have my store of APIs on the corner, and I can reuse all that stuff, deploy it automatically, have all the life cycle of the application being taken care of for me. And this is the environment we built with them. So this is a product we now, we're going to release a product. It's called App Factory. So the idea is to have an entire um, lifecycle management application. If you guys know Eriku, CloudBees, this is the kind of environments, right? So all you have to do, if you're a developer, um, actually somebody on the first day, I can't remember his name, said, if you're a developer and you create APIs or you create anything, your only interaction with the system should be clone a repository, push a change in the repository. That's it, okay? So what happens in that environment is, if you're a developer, you do a git push, and you commit something into the system, automatically behind the scenes, there's a build that will happen, the code will be checked, everything is done for you. Continuous integration, continuous testing, all you have to do is matter about writing the code, and that's all they do. So they build this entire ecosystem, it's all running on Amazon, and they're going to give that to every single airline so that they publish their APIs, every airline can publish their own APIs, but also contribute around the system and contribute their own apps as well. So that's another point which is very important. As we worked with them and other customers, the notion of a store is extremely critical. So you all should have, if you have APIs, an API store or some kind of portal where people will come and consume your APIs from. But those guys that told us, like, you, you, need, you know, APIs, this is good, but that's not enough, right? What I really want to have is an, a store of, you know, code libraries that I've been creating that you can reuse in your applications. Applications themselves, mobile applications, but all in the same store. So we've been generalizing the store we had created for the API manager, which is called the API store, and we made a generic version of it, and we called it the enterprise store, right? So what the enterprise store allows you to do, uh, as you can see probably in here, there's like three types of assets, gadgets, websites, eBooks, right? And what this allows you to do is basically have a central place where they will put their apps, they'll put their web apps, they'll put their APIs, and collaboratively, collaboratively, sorry, every single airline will come and push this information into there and share whatever they want to share, all right? So that's the ecosystem we've created for them. It's kind of big, <laughs> okay? It's a huge installation, but it's kind of the ultimate ecosystem. So I'm not saying you should all do that, but guys in the back, please, shh. <laughs> okay, so I'm not saying you should all do that. It's kind of an extreme position. But the message really should be that if you just drop your APIs, as Judy was saying, really, in a, a store, however nice the store is, you may not have the success that you're looking for if you want adoption, right? By giving people another step, which is like not only the APIs, but giving you the entire space to create their apps and, and actually didn't you get requests from people using your, using your APIs to actually contribute applications that they have written with your APIs? Wouldn't that be cool? Like the Deezer stuff I'm talking about, for example. Right? If I'm writing an application with Deezer APIs, that'd be great. I can contribute it back to a central store saying, this is the application I've written using those APIs. Take it as an example, for example. And that's how you build the ecosystem. So some lessons learned. Uh, from from those guys. Shh. Okay, we're going to do something. I wanted to do that yesterday. I'm going to do it again. All right. D you guys need to stretch. It's kind of 12 or something. Okay. So I'm going to ask you something. Okay. The guys from 
this side, so this is the divide, okay? Guys from this side, you all turn to your left, okay? The guys to the right, you all turn to your right, and you all go. Okay. Watch, right there. One, two, three. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> then you can stretch on those sides. All right, so lessons learned. Um, so I had an interesting discussion this morning with somebody about soap and rest. And it's like, we all want to rest, and there's some people that want to do soap, and we want to kill them. Um, <laughs> right? Okay? One thing we've seen is, uh, this is Boeing and other customers as well. This is like a religious battle. You know, it's like when I was young, there was the religious battle between Emacs and VI as an editor, and you had to be on one side or the other. You could not use VI and Emacs at the same time. That was like being a trader on either side, okay? Now, we have to face it. I love REST. I have nothing against REST. The pure one, the non-pure one, it all works. Okay, whatever works for you. But you have to admit that SOAP has been there for a long time. There's a lots of very good, however complex, things around it. But I'm talking about security, right? Encryption, digital signatures, all that stuff. If we start to reproduce this on the REST side, we're going to make it as complicated as SOAP is. So you probably don't want to do that. But there's a lot of reasons still to be using one or the other. And there might be some cases for requirements purposes that you will need to use SOAP and not REST. So don't, don't discard it just saying, oh, it's SOAP, it's bad. Okay, I don't want to use it. Just you may have to, okay? So whatever works is what you have to use based on your requirements. That's really an important message. Of course, JSON. So everything they do is JSON. Why? Because of the mobile world. That's very important. Uh, it's much easier to do. And also a critical point, um, I've been doing SOA from the beginning. That's what IBM when I started working on this. And I remember, you know, all those services that we were creating. And then it's like, who the heck is reusing that stuff? First of all, we had no idea because there was no tracking. But then you, you soon realize there's like one client per service and one application consuming a single service. And that really is not working. That is not reuse, okay? So if you're in that case, you've created so many APIs, it, doesn't, it works exactly the same in the API world. And you see that, you know, there's always one application that uses an API and nobody else is using it. Something is wrong with that picture if it happens for every single API you have. So detect that pattern and fix it. Because that's, it means, it may mean a lot of things. It may mean that the API is not needed. It may be the design needs to be redone. It may need a lot of things, but it sure is not a good sign, okay? So detect that and fix it. Iterate, iterate. The way they've been doing this is just take a thin slice, implement it, try again, try again. You may not be right at the first time, and that's okay. You know, your API, you know, unless you're a bloody genius, probably the, you know, the design of your API and the way it works is not going to be right the first time, but that's okay. Okay, then you do a version two, and you do a version three, and you deprecate and you continue. Okay, that's very important. Um, another thing I think where SOA kind of failed, right, is we've not, in the SOA world, it was all about internal consumption at the time. And we didn't really consider our consumers internally to our customers. And that's really what failed. And that's where API has been very successful. Because when you publish an API and it's going to be used by whoever in Sri Lanka, just saying this country, but I will see why, right? About you know, 8,000 miles away from here, and somebody in Sri Lanka was gonna find the Deezer API. Right? They're not, they can't just go and bother Julie and say, how is this thing working? Okay, the only thing they have to understand how it works is the documentation and all the ecosystem around it, and that's it. They're your customer. You can't change that API every five minutes either. You're gonna you know, drive them crazy. And that's what we've been doing in the SOA world, right? So should the consumption of your API be internal or external? Treat that person as your customer, as if you don't know them pretty much, right? And treat them the same way internally as you would to somebody who is outside. And then the reuse and consumption will work. And the last one is a bit, yeah, difficult, but you know, make sure that the, the bosses don't get in the middle of all this, but that's kind of difficult. No. Who the heck are we? <laughs> okay, first and foremost, we are the people 
fueling API culture. That's like the most important thing. Uh, how's my API culture friends? They're gone? <laughs> Eduardo, okay, I have to do this for him. Uh, this is my best customer worldwide, I have to say. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're doing a, a great job. So we have an API management product and that's the fuel behind uh, API culture. But what do we do? So there's a full open source provider. What does that mean? That means like everything we do, you can go to the WSO2.com, download and use as much as you want and I'll never know. Well, I'll know because you'll have to fill a form, but that's it, okay? No strings attached. If at some point you want to actually get some formal support for this, then this is when we'll jump in. Everything we do is in our Apache license. Take it, use it, do as you want, contribute to it. We love that, okay? We do integration, governance, API management, all the analytics around it. And we're also fueling so that the Boeing guys that pretty much use the entire platform you can have a look on the website and see what that contains. Um, we also have a platform as a service that we recently donated to Apache. It's called Stratos, runs on OpenStack um, and other infrastructure as a service. So that's an option if you need an open source pass, you have a look at Stratos. And also we've created this app factory thing with uh, Boeing and with other customers that had this need of creating this you know, app ecosystem around uh, their company and help their consumers um, basically create applications around this. Am I good? I think I am. Um, thank you very much. I've put in the presentation, I don't know if people will be able to download the press at some point, uh, some keynotes from a recent uh, conference. If you want to hear more about how this Boeing thing is working, there's a one hour presentation. Just go to our website, you'll find it on the events. Um, where you know the, the gentleman who was in charge of the whole program explained how they did it. It's a really interesting and enlightening uh, journey that they have taken. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Ready for questions. Thank, thank you, Isabel. Thank you. We have time for questions. Oh, many arms, but it was to scratch. <laughs> Can you tell me something about uh, the security solution you used uh, at Boeing? So the security, sorry, the security solution we used at Boeing is based on our identity server, which has been extended for some specific uh, use cases that they have, uh, which are very specific to Boeing, so it's not something we're going to pull back into the product. But we have a complete identity server, it is like SSO, SAML, uh, basically, uh, their, their need is an interesting one in terms of API management is they need a complete SSO across the entire system. So somebody from Delta Airlines on a tarmac with his iPad needs to be able to connect and log in with their logins and getting into Boeing systems, for example. So we're handling all of this behind the scenes. Another question? I guess you're hungry. Maybe is always a question. You yeah. know that. Always. No, it's, uh, it's a good question this time. Uh, now this time is, you know, you, you've talked about the, um, well, you've talked about the uh, building an ecosystem around a company like Boeing. Um, and I'm, you know, this conference is also API in the future of software. So I wanted your vision about, you know, we, say often, we often say open API is, is enabling, enabled you to op have an ecosystem. Sometimes in the press, it's often to long tail developers, web and mobile, that makes. Um, but you are talking about B2B ecosystem uh, in this part. So in, at your, in your opinion, what is the part of the, the, the B2B ecosystem in the, we can say the API industry, API economy or API market, you know, in, in average, in percentage. So does it represent 50% of the value, 60, 95, 5% in your opinion? You know, to just because you are on the enterprise side, for example, me, I'm often on the startup and developer side, so what is your point of it? It is indeed a good question. <laughs> um, it's hard to give a percentage, but I can tell you that the, the Boeing case is not a single, well, and it's a representative case. Uh, but we do see a lot of our customers wanting to use API to integrate with the partners and, and consumers. Uh, in, in the B2B way. That, that's really something that's an emerging pattern. 
And I'm saying like the APIs is really the, the fuel for being able to do that. And, and you know, you, you can't do that without the APIs, I'll put it this way. That's the first step, you know, and, and everything that's around it. And the next step will be to build like this first ecosystem of portals and things, which is a, a great beginning. The, the um, constructing this enterprise ecosystem as they have done, it's kind of the ultimate, I will be next step in the sense of, you know, you could do this for regulation purposes. There's another customer that we work with. What they have to do is, it's basically, it's a betting company. So you, if you, in a country where it's uh, pretty much uh, illegal to do a betting without having a license, and it's very expensive to buy a betting license. It's like millions, okay? So what they do is they allow you to build your own betting application inside their environment. So everything needs to be hosted in their environment. And the only thing they give you is basically a Git URL. And that's it. The same thing I've said right now. They give the developers a Git URL and the entire environment around it to deploy and run the application. Right? I, I can't give you a percentage, I'm sorry. But, but from our customer perspective, I'd say probably half of them. OK? So half of them is 50%. So <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, no. I'm joking. I, I just I just wanted a percentage to tweet something. But thank you, Isabel, please. Thank you. Well, some applause.